Okay, well, I guess, uh, let's see, I, I grew up in New York, and um, I, I uh, went to school in Boston. I went to Boston College, and, and then in, uh, let's see, 1991, I, uh, I went to my first Macworld in San Francisco, and um, I was just blown away. Uh, it was my first time uh, at Silicon Valley as an adult. I, I think I was there when I was a little child or something, but I didn't remember it. And uh, it was my first Macworld, and I was, I was just blown away at, at everything. And uh, and I just had to be part of it. So a few months later, I, I quit my job, and I, I packed everything I owned into uh, my hatchback. <laughs> and I in four days later, I drove from Boston to San Francisco, <laughs> and uh, I got a little studio apartment in uh, Haight-Ashbury. And, uh, and I, I, I made my career there. I was there for 10 years. Um, I worked at a, at a few startups. Um, and uh, the one that kind of changed my life was a company called Web TV Networks. Um, and uh, I joined before the company was acquired by Microsoft and um, ran business development um, there for a number of, of things that, you know, uh, were really exciting. And... Um, and uh, a couple of years later, Microsoft bought the company. Um, I stayed at Microsoft for a little while, but I, I really didn't. It was no nothing bad about Microsoft, but I'm not a big company kind of guy. Uh, so um, 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 the founder of Web TV, a guy named Steve Perlman, and a number of other Web TV folks, uh, we created a company called Moxie Digital, which we sold to Paul Allen a few years after that. Um, which was, uh, it was not quite as successful as web TV by any means. It actually had, uh, some problems, but, but we had a, a big idea. And so it was kind of the amazing ride of web TV and then, and then the not, not great ride of, of Moxie. Um, but, uh, it was still an amazing experience. Um, and, um, after that, um, after Moxie, I moved to Boston, my wife's family, I'd since gotten married in Silicon Valley and okay. uh, we had our first daughter in, in San Francisco and, uh, my, our families are all back east, and uh, we decided to move back home. So uh, 10 years later, basically, uh, we came back. Um, I didn't know anybody out here anymore, and uh, but I got introduced to the folks at Charles River Ventures. And um, anyway, this is probably a very boring story, but one of the guys I met at Charles River Ventures was a guy named Santo. Uh, he was a partner there, and we just hit it off like peanut butter and jelly, and uh, we were interested in the same things. Yeah. And uh, I had no desire to be a venture capitalist, but I, I really wanted to uh, work with him. And so uh, by a few years later, he decided he wanted to leave Charles River. Uh, we became quite close to this guy named Todd Dagers at Battery. And they had a whole thesis around uh, a new type of venture capital firm. And uh, and they asked me to come along. I mean, I, I had no track record as a VC. They gave me a shot and, uh, and I took it. <laughs> ah, okay. And, and for me, I, I really kind of thought about it as it was another startup. You know, we were we were building a, a company from scratch, and um, you know, yes, we raised a fund and everything else, but uh, nobody ever heard of Spark Capital in two thousand and five. Uh, and I'm sure there's people today that never heard of Spark <laughs> Capital, but, but certainly two thousand and five, uh, nobody ever heard of us. And um, and and we just you know went to work. Um, and I, I really consider this. You know, the, the best entrepreneurial decision I've ever made. It was, uh, you know, a lot of people were wondering, like, why did I do this? And what if you're not good at it? What if you really suck at it? And I, I said, uh, there's only one way to find out if I suck at it. <laughs> um, so that, that was why I did it. And, uh, and I've, I've fallen in love with it. Well, I guess the thing that I tried to think about when I decided to um, join up um, with the guys and, and start Spark was, you know, I was I was kind of committed to investing in things that I was personally passionate about. I decided to use the same the same mindset that I'd have about joining an early stage startup or or getting one going, and then doing something I, I would love. I mean, you know, and and uh, I think when you're an entrepreneur, you only work on things that you love. And I think there are some VCs that invest in things that they love, but they also invest in things that they think will be a good investment. And uh, and for me, I, I decided that the only way I'm going to have a reasonable chance of, of, of doing this is if I invest in things that I, I'm passionate about, that I know something about, that I have experience in, and that, um, and that I cared about. You know? And I mean, there's a lot of things to invest in the world, but I just felt that I was going to you know, limit and really focus on, on things that were 
you know, personally interesting to me and, and things that I, I wake up every day excited about. And, and, uh, and that was the only way I could do it. I think if, if another venture firm ever called me and said, Hey, uh, you should be a VC here. And they were like a, a life sciences firm or something. It's not that I have a problem with life sciences, but I, I don't know anything about it. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and, uh, and it's not something I'm really passionate about. So that, that's how I convinced myself that it's something I wanted to do. I felt like I could work every day with entrepreneurs that were building things that I cared about. And, and, uh, and that's what I, I wanted to do. Well, um, you know, it wasn't like one thing. I think it was a, it was a combination of things. You know, I lived in Silicon Valley for 10 years, so that helped. You know, even though I'm, I'm in Boston now, you know, we made a lot of investments in Silicon Valley in New York. I met Fred, as an example, I met Fred Wilson before Spark. Um, he had invested in a good friend of mine's company, uh, uh, Steve Kane uh, back at Gainesville. We met through through Steve. Um, I met Biz at Twitter. Um, my friend Andy Rubin, who I work with at Web TV, who now runs Android Create Android. He introduced me to some Google guys. Introduced me to Biz. Okay. Uh, so it was it wasn't just like one thing. It was just basically uh, you know um, you know my network and um, you know frankly blogging and and Twitter changed my life. I mean, it, it really um, enabled me to have a voice and was able to to meet a lot of people just like I met you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's hard to uh, uh, underemphasize, you know, that my uh, relationship with my kids and my wife is a defining moment. I mean, I, um, you know, they, they absolutely mean more to me than anything. So that's, that's uh, something that I, I uh, has, has had, you know, an endless impact on, on my life. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a hard thing to juggle, kind of like being involved in your family and your work and, and all these things. So I, I think uh, at times um, it, it's something to try to balance and all that. But, I mean, at the end of the day, my uh, family means more to me than anything. So that, that's been my uh, how, how I think about things and prioritize things. Um, well, I mean, I, I think it's just hard. I mean, I think it's not a, an easy answer. I think it's just a, a commitment to trying to make it work. And, uh, so I, I think, you know, there are moments where, you know, it all feels like, you know, trying to make it all happen is impossible, but you know, it's, it's really a commitment. I think, uh, the only thing that's been sacrificed is my sleep. <laughs> so, uh, you know, basically to be as involved as I want to be as a, as a dad and as a husband and as a VC, it just means something had to give. And, and right now, at least for the last six years, uh, sleep has been giving. <laughs> but um, I'm having a good time. It's right. a lot of fun. You know, really do my best not to uh, do any email. Uh, for example, on Saturdays, I, I okay. you know, if I'm, if I'm doing email on Saturdays, then something is wrong in the universe. And, um, you know, I actually try not to, to do an email on Sundays too, but by Sunday night, I'm, I'm, I'm sucked back into the vortex. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, I try, I try to do those kinds of boundaries. You know, for a while, I tried to do this thing where I wouldn't, you know, have my phone with me at dinner with my family because I wanted to make sure I was kind of in the moment and present. But, but my kids are kind of now loving Foursquare so much like there's this thing that we do when we go to restaurants where my kids are like, hey, can I check in for you? Because my kids love checking in and then scanning the, the app. Um, I don't know if you use Foursquare, but it's a check who else is in the restaurant. So, you know, leaving my phone behind is, is no longer an option. Um, so, uh, but as far as boundaries go, you know, I, I really try to, to do my best to separate, you know, my work life from my, my personal life and, um, and uh, kind of when I'm, I'm uh, it's kind of when I'm working, I'm working. When I'm not, I'm not. Um, and but uh, you know, we're all human. Sometimes it, it works better than others. Um, I, I have started to take more vacations in the last year or two to kind of get give my body a chance to catch up. But um, you know, I think it's something. It's a process, and I, I used to suck at it, and I'm getting a little better at it. Well, I guess in 10 years, it, these things are hard to predict, of course, but I, I think the most exciting thing about uh, startups is is that um, things move so much more faster than you could possibly imagine. I mean, I, I think that um, the rate of acceleration, I mean, one data point how much things are going faster. When I look at, you know, very big companies now in terms of uh, their scale, 
not in terms of employees, but scale. You know, think about how big Twitter and Tumblr are. Uh, they're, they're very large properties and large networks. But in their first year, they had uh, less than a million users. You know, something like, I think Tumblr had like 400,000 users. And, and Twitter had maybe, you know, more than that. But it wasn't millions in their first year. And, you know, we have this company called OMG Pop that I wrote about yesterday. And, you know, in... in uh, in 20 days, they have, by the end of today, they'll have 8 million users, okay, okay. and on, the, on one game, and uh, and that's because, you know, their iPhone wasn't invented when Twitter was born and when Tumblr was born, so all these new things that are coming out, these new technologies, ways for us to connect um, in new ways, thanks to mobile and broadband, etc., like, it's just getting to the point where uh, it's hard to predict the acceleration of these things. The things that we used to think were fast-growing are not fast-growing anymore. So I, I guess the thing that we really, um, you know, just believe is, is how much we're still in the early days of all this stuff. So I, I guess the reason I'm bringing that up is when you ask about 10 years from now, you know, you, you may, I may say things about how many people in the world are going to have connected devices. So it, it may feel like a ridiculous number, but when you think about it in that context, it's, it's less ridiculous. Um, so I, I really think the other part I, I think about 10 years is that I think the sector that we're working in, in the tech sector, and startups is the future, and um, that's why I'm really excited about initiatives like what's happening at Stack Overflow and Code Academy and things like that to help you know everybody learn how to program. I think this is this is the area of, of growth that we should be all excited about and celebrate. And I think it's going to have to be an important uh, part of the fabric of, of our um, you know global economy. Yeah, I, I think the thing that I've seen with the leaders that I've worked with um, is to, to be brave and to take a chance. I mean, I think that, you know, when I look at any of the, the exceptional leaders that we end up um, doing business with and, and investing in and working with every day, I mean, they all have different skills. But the one thing that all the successful ones is that they, they're, they're really brave people. I mean, it's so much harder to do what they do than it looks. Uh, but you, you have to be able to take a chance and and to to um, and to be brave about things. And I, and I think that's that's the essential thing. I mean, I think there's other things that are critical, but those if you don't have those, it's it's really hard to to um, to be a successful leader.